welcome everyone. We have Michael C, we have Jan B, and we have Jamie and myself, Michael. Uh, Jamie, you have some news? Uh, I did commit the include file stuff, which anybody who follows the commit lists has seen. Uh, no news as to what it in, what it entails. It has what it had last week. Now it's just in the tree. That is great news. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as the developer, have you heard of anything on slushes and freezes regarding 14, or did that look like it made it in? I have uh, not heard any announcement on an updated 14 calendar, so I assume it's in. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Boom, 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 add. Is that the correct one or did I click the wrong one? That looks uh, you were at the correct one before. Committed, there we there go. There we go. Yeah, pushing. Huh, uh, maybe that's somehow mislinked, but anyway. Oh, well, now that goes back there, okay. Oh, maybe, uh, anyway, well, great news. Thank you, that is fantastic. Uh, I'll put a big old committed there and uh, if I can spell it right and welcome Anthony and welcome Mohammed. Anthony. Hey, thanks to be here. Hey, is this your first visit, Anthony? Uh, first visit in a while. Yeah, it's been, a, okay, cool. been really busy for the last couple months, unfortunately. Understood. Uh, briefly on reviews. Our, Jamie, I don't know if you're on the call when we brought these up, but uh, Michael C., who is present, has a review on jail ABI fallback for when using Linux jails. Have you? Is that on your radar? Yes. I don't recall if I had subscribe, right? really uh, given the attention it deserves, but I know I've given it a look. Yes, I definitely see your feedback there. Cool. Uh, Michael is present if you have any questions or concerns to share with him. Um, I do have one, one question on that that I don't recall if I've asked on there, but uh, the ABI fallback sys controls seem to be you know, one 32-bit one and one 64-bit one, and then an overarching one that has an XXX comment that says, oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, the XSX comment could go away. So do we know if this is going, going to be something that's going to go away or should we take off the comment that says it's going to go away? Because it seems like we're building on something possibly temporary. Right, so um, I have an other commit that basically we use the, uh, the XSX uh, syscontrol for, uh, basically we use it for the real stuff because even Ed agrees like, hmm, why do we have to uh, L32 and L64, why are they different? Uh, so I actually opened a separate uh, review for uh, that part of the uh, change. Uh, so okay. we basically have one thing that just deal with the uh, fallback uh, ABI brand and the other deal with the syscontrol part. Okay. Yeah, is that review handy or is it linked here? Uh, yeah, I think it's in the stack. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom, uh, okay. okay and then uh, oh. there's a child revision. This one, perhaps? Yep. Okay. Yes. I have not uh, taken a look at the, uh, taken a look at since you've added that part, it looks like. Yeah, accidentally, we now we move uh, X to six from this tree, which is good. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if, if it's the right way to do it as well, because uh, I feel like we are we using something people expected to be deprecated. Uh, and then we are deprecated the things that deprecated the previous system calls. And yeah, so interesting stuff. Yeah, so the point of the uh, ABI brand is that uh, despite currently, if you do load Linux, 60, uh, Linux instead of Linux 64, it does have an RC script that automatically configurate the uh, EFI for that. But the problem is that, you know, if you want to be a bit 
uh, rigorous, you will want to have it actually per gel uh, such that you don't technically have to mess with the base system and things like that. Say, if you really don't want the base system to always fall back to Linux. So that's why it is added. Uh, I also solved a problem when I uh, make my tool, which is that my own implementation does a lot of uh, pre-checks. And one of the pre-checks is that um, if the container can be launched successfully, and that means checking the ELF brand. Uh, on ARM64, uh, that means uh, by default, when you load the Linux 64 kernel module on ARM, it does not actually change the global uh, EFI for that brand. And I don't want to rely on that. And adding this feature basically allow me to say, uh, here's a job parameter to say the ABI brand is Linux, such that everything running in this brand uh, in this jail uh, would add us if it's already rebranded. So we don't have to uh, deal with the elf branding at all. I mean, a brand elf command at all. Okay. That's, yeah, so basically- the This is getting outside of my expertise, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically how the elf brand work is that, um, Basically, uh, it would, the FreeBSD system is going to use a lot of ways to determine like what's the correct ELF brand, for example, like the linker or that thing, and check the symbols and everything. And only if the FreeBSD kernel cannot determine if like uh, the, the API of that executable, it will require the fallback brand. Um, this is usually the case with static link binary because in the dynamic link binary, you can look up for the glibc or uh, related stuff. And then you can kind of say, oh, this is a Linux binary. But uh, if it's like static link one, like go whatever, usually uh, there are not enough information for FreeBSD to figure out like, oh, is it really a system five binary or is it like a Linux binary? And then you need to use brand health. So um, if brand health does not work, you would use a syscontrol for that brand just try to say, see like, okay, can I assume this is a, a Linux um, ABI and does everything make sense? If everything still makes sense, then you run it. If you assume it's like a, a Linux API and things does not um, work out and then the uh, image activator will still deny it. So basically uh, it's a pretty safe change. Anything else regarding those two reviews? Just uh, one question. Are FreeBSD executables uh, expected to be always branded or do we really rely on this uh, falling back to the native API for unbranded executables uh, on a regular basis? Uh, we always, as, as far as I know from the source, we always check for like, what the FreeBSD expected. And I think uh, on FreeBSD binary is usually always branded. Uh, basically the fallback brand uh, thing only kicks in when there's no way for the system to determine what ABI it is. So uh, it actually does not affect the normal use of the system because if you try to run a normal FreeBSD binary, it never is supposed to be, never ever hit uh, the fallback path. Uh, subroutine so because it's a it's like a last resort thing right if you can mm -hmm. find you can figure out it's free bsd you already entered early exit right and then everything's fine and only if and only if like there's no way for the system to determine uh the correct brand basically a fallback brand is like okay now try one more brand uh assume it's three which is linux and then if it works it works if it's if the uh, kernel say it still doesn't make sense, then the kernel still won't run the binary. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Cool. Anything else on that? Or can we take a quick look at route? Route came up on the last call. Uh, I don't know if this is also on your radar, Jamie. I don't see you listed as a reviewer. And so Michael also took a stab at 
adding uh, jail support to the route command. Let's see how big that is. Okay, I've seen it. I have it listed under, in my bookmarks at least. Okay, so cool, cool. I'm not sure I've done more than, oh, I should bookmark this because. <laughs> Understood. So anyway, if, if you have any ban mental bandwidth for that, that's not a giant patch so far. So I see he's bringing in the, the jail headers and acting upon them. Set fib. Yeah. Um, so. I have another command which uh, should be fairly simple to add jail awareness to, and that's uh, set fib, so that you can change the routing table. Yes. Yeah, so on the on recent calls, we just did a really informal audit, and I'll just scroll down to that of like what commands are supported. And so we came up with a few shooting from the hip here. Um, of course, the J command, Sockstat, TZ setup. I think Mohammed, you added that. Thank you. Mentioned that package, uh, route in progress. Um, if config, I don't know the state of it's that. Work in progress. Okay. I think if config is already committed. Oh. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, after my if config got committed, I received a com comment on the um, on review to ask me about the route thing. So uh, that's why I also changed, uh, I also patched the route. So if coming is a COVID, I think by the UN. Cool. Well, that list is growing pretty rapidly. So that yeah, for I your- mean, It's easy side. to change then, you know, we should just, you know, uh, do it and try to stuff it into 14. Cool. Um, and along those lines, uh, before others joined, Michael and I were talking about a patch for unprivileged jail attach. Uh, what form is that taking? Has that reached review or is it just something in your uh, own It's just directory? something I'm experimenting locally because uh, there's a couple of approach I'm, uh, I'm uh, going for. One is allow multiple specify unprivileged user to attach. And then one is only allow one. Uh, basically, the idea is that jail creation is still supposed to be something um, a privileged user is supposed to be do instead of like a privileged user because you are you are kind of like creating a privileged like a privileged subdomain. So you know the root user is supposed to have the right to uh, to do that instead of a unprivileged user. Um, but after the privileged user create the jail, uh, my implementation is that uh, it can set. Uh, a certain user in the parent jail to uh, be able to attach to the jail. So basically it's like, okay, uh, user, let's say 501 is allowed to attach to the jail and then uh, user 501 can call jail attach system call uh, without uh, EPERM and just attach to it. Now, if uh, user 501 want to do some set UI uh, D stuff, um, before calling jail attach, it just doesn't work. Uh, so basically just kind of just patching the jail attach but it doesn't really handle uh, the other things. Um, uh, yeah. It may be so you, you um, still cannot remove a jail. You can only like move a process uh, to a jail. You cannot create a jail. You cannot delete a jail. There uh, are already but, use cases which match this but it would probably be useful to uh, make it possible to check against uh, a process uh, groups as well, because otherwise you have to bless each user individually and you have no, uh, you only have a one-to-one -one mapping and not a one-to-many yeah. mapping. The one-to-many mapping basically is have a length list in the jail, in the prison structure, and then I call it prison off kind of thing. And then basically mm -hmm. walk through the um, potentially you can expand it to policies as well. And then see if uh, some users are supposed to be able to attach to the jail and then do it. Um, but right now I'm kind of playing with the idea, kind of apply the patch to my local system and see kind of what kind of things I'm missing. Um, but if there's like some security like concern, whatever, I think, you know, uh, you guys figure it out then. That's great. As long as the right? super user has to add the list of user IDs or group IDs to be allowed to attach to a jail, I don't see a large attack surface. 
Yep. So basically, it's only UID. It's not even groups. It's just like okay, yep. user. Yeah. You you can like okay, five hundred one of this jail. You can go. You can move process to, uh, the children's. Right. You cannot. You cannot move to like your parent jails. So you have to move to the children's. And the way it is done is basically, um, walk from the target jail and then walk all the way up. See if it finds like the. Yep. Same jail that the uh, you, uh, the Ukraine is in. Yeah. This so uh, be I'm just playing with case. the idea. Yeah. This because would also my be... use case. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. My yeah. use case usually uh, in HPC environment when you typically can have users. Um, so this is actually a problem with Docker as well. So Docker run everything in the background. So when you queue the program process, you're really only queuing the TTY or like the standard in, you are not actually queuing the process, but allowing a user to move a process to a jail using jail attach means queuing the seemingly foreground process actually queuing the entire process. So that can be useful in kind of, if you mix use with some like a job manager, like Slurm or things like that. But I'm not sure if the use case is that broad uh, to deserve such change that maybe uh, affect the security aspect of jail. Jamie, any initial thoughts on this? I'm uh, still in partly through the uh, coding phase, but more in the thinking phase of uh, jail descriptors, which we talked about before, which seems to uh, see a seems to be one of the uh, more elegant ways of doing this. And you know, you uh, open a descriptor to a jail, and then you can change the user ID, and then you could attach to the descriptor, which still exists. And if you wanted to uh, use file system access control, if these jails are represented as device nodes, potentially you could allow a user's access to it. The problem is that basically any kind of modification should require write access to the device. And unless you break the jail out to basically one device per class of operations, basically one attached device, one stop device and so on, unless you do that, uh, you still require capsicum or similar to limit vi octals or whatever is used to perform these operations on the file descriptors i'm not thinking yeah. of putting it into the file system space like nope. in, yeah. in devfs or anything i'm thinking of yep. a system call well actually like the jail get system call to get the file descriptor mm -hmm. and maybe uh being able to change mode bits or user on the file descriptor i haven't really so I've already thought the, about uh, that, but not, not to uh, make space for file systems, no. Okay. So one of the ways uh, which is quite flexible to extend this file descriptor would be to offer I.O. controls on them. Yeah. And the nice thing about I.O. controls, while they're a bit annoying to program against, is that Capsicum understands I.O. controls. So you can take such a file descriptor for a jail, and even without uh, requiring any process to be sandboxed, you can take a file descriptor and say only these specific I/O controls are allowed on this copy of a file descriptor, and then pass this via either process inheritance or file descriptor passing to another process, yeah, so that you can I, basically I um, partition the uh, capability which is represented by the file descriptor. To, for yeah, example, think, only be able to attach, only be able to stop a jail. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm more to lean towards the just descriptor instead of in the file system because jail itself kind of, you know, starting from like maneuvering like the file system namespace. So if you put the control of jail also in the file system, then that that can be a, a bit disastrous. disastrous. Uh, but if we have like a jail descriptor, kind of like we have like a process descriptor mm -hmm. right now, that would be really awesome. That uh, would be awesome. Because you can also add things, not sure if it's, it's the right abstraction, but if we have like KQ events saying through uh, jail descriptor, that would be really awesome. Yes. Uh, the reason why is 
sometimes if we want to really supervise a gel, it's really nice to know when there's a process enter the gel. So as a supervisor, you can listen to that um, and figure out what to do. And when you close the descriptor, it determines the gel is also the right behavior. Uh, that would be really awesome. Yeah. Yes, there's already a, a kernel module available as port, just 200 or oh, 300 lines of C, which exports most jail events via DevCTL. The problem with yeah, this design I, is that I it only that, yeah. works in the parent, uh, so only in the root jail outside of any jails because uh, the DevCTL file descriptor is only available to the parent. So you can't have DevD and so on in a jail. It doesn't mm -hmm. nest. And yeah, the other issue is, with that is that uh, in order for, let's say if I'm like a supervisor, I want to listen to events of the jail, Mm -hmm. I would actually have to uh, kind of pass all the DevFS events as well. So if you want yeah. to limit the privilege of that supervisor to only listen to the event happen in the jail, you actually cannot do that because uh, the DevD thing is sent over a sequence packet socket. So you, you mm -hmm. receive everything. Yes. Yeah, you, you basically receive everything that's using DevD in the system. Uh, oh, following the no DevD filter. isn't sustainable. The only way to do it would be to drop a snippet into DevD's configuration and have it fork per message, a small command to notify your watcher, basically extract the gel identifier, map it to some socket name and tell you about yeah. it. But, and then you have like a terrifying, like to integrate, like say a supervisor, if each yeah. thing utility from pause, it would be a nightmare. Right, because you have to have the user manually go into DevD's config and then. No, to... you don't, because uh, DevD has a support for DevD.D where you can simply drop a file in. Yeah, and... but then you have to drop it in like yes. slash SC. Right? But so... that's uh, automatable. Okay. And, but yes, it's uh, really quite uh, reaching the limits of. Uh, the design and then some. Mm -hmm. um, a file descriptor would also avoid all of the race conditions by passing along identifiers like jail IDs and names over sockets. Because mm -hmm. as long as there's a file descriptor referencing the jail, the, the jail can at worst be dying. It cannot be destroyed and recreated to a new jail. Mm -hmm. Because you right. can and actually all the jail intentionally reuse being a jail identifier. Safer with that. Yes. Repeat that last part. Each jail utility is what regarding that? It's made safer with that. I, I could see it kind of being a standard thing in, you know, th things like jail attach. You know, you look up a name and then you attach to that JID. But yeah, there's the race right there. Yes. I, I like it better. You look up a name and you have the jail. And then you attach the descriptor you got back. Mm -hmm. because if you specify your jail by a jail ID directly, you can actually create a jail with a already released jail ID be only because the kernel counts up auto allocated jail IDs and auto increments them. And this doesn't mean that you have to use the auto increment feature. You can say, I want to create a new jail too. And well, if it's available, the kernel will let you do that, and you have a reused uh, jail yeah. ID. I'm still tempted to deprecate that sometime. Never should have had it. Yeah, I mean, jail ID part of shouldn't that? be reusable. The, the part where you can specify a jail ID. It was a bad idea. But it will break stuff because there have been tutorials, for example, at last year's UBSD con about make sure that you, if you do this, you create, avoid the race so that you did get a random jail id people have yeah. actually considered this a feature to specify that you have a stable identifier across restarts yeah yeah that's true that. it's, yeah, it's probably not it, bad. it might be my talk because i was talking on last ubc call about jail but i think my position is that that is actually a horrible idea uh just as like the jail utilities does not actually handle if the jail basically release prematurely uh, 
outside, if you're not using gel dash out, your a cleanup routine won't run. And mm-hmm. I think Luca had the same stand. Like I think no one likes uh, that except like a few people who use gel ID as a part uh, of their router or something. They say, oh, I just need to trace like gel ID five. I, I think there are people is doing that, but I think it's it's not really a well known feature. And it's yeah. nice the user population is quite small that I don't think there will be much issue if if we change that or we can just add a new sys control to control like the behavior. Oh hmm. having a CCTL to disable sanity features is um problematic because suddenly you can't rely on sanity anymore. Yeah, but it's also like a thing that if you if you screw it up, it's not our problem. Okay, anything else relating to that? And my, my apologies for my browser crashing, so my share went away. Um, and is it sounding like some form of jail descriptor is still the best way forward? Oh yeah, definitely. I would love to have a jail descriptor. That would be awesome. If we have that, we should also look into, uh, but that's orthogonal to it in a pure user space feature, a dedicated, basically, always on a uh, file descriptor holding daemon where you can store your file descriptor in a running process and retrieve it later on. So that you yeah. Something. yeah, something like that could be made yeah, after the feature is available. Something like this is uh, already available in S6 and they're using it heavily, for example, to retrieve the, the pipe used for logging between the process which logs to standard out and error and uh, the log consumer so that you never lose a message which is stuck in a pipe buffer because the same pipe is reused if even if both sites are restarted at the same time Uh, so this is a existing pattern there's code to look at cool that and we can have it even easier uh, in FreeBSD because if it's only targeting FreeBSD, we can rely on the presence of sequential packet sockets, which really makes the whole file descriptor passing code a lot nicer because you no longer have to worry about message boundaries and uh, best effort uh, packet processing. So you get an ordered message stream, which uh, can make the protocol even simpler. Yeah, sounds good. Got it. Uh, Anthony, do you have anything up your sleeve? Questions, news, reports, demos before Michael C. jumps into a little demo? No, not at the moment. Um, the things that I've been fooling around with are kind of trying to get ARM, ARM distributions working with, uh, um, with Beehive and Jail, so... That's been interesting. Uh, do but tell. Any links to share regarding that? Beehive on ARM? Well, it's, I'm kind of working. <laughs> it's a work in progress, but I just got a new uh, MacBook. So my my thought here was, how can I make uh, nested VMs in Mac OS on ARM? And I've got it installed, but it keeps on giving me, like, I'm getting messages and such in terminal using KVM. So it's almost there, but I haven't had time to actually try and finish it. Under um, Mac OS with their hypervisor framework or under say FreeBSD on? Un, under Mac OS running KVM from command line, I managed okay. to get um, FreeBSD ARM 13 uh, running. And the interesting part about it was I was able to KLD load modules. So I haven't been able to figure out how to load the VM module, but my my thought process there was to basically um, create a black hole inside Mac OS that would allow me to use FreeBSD as a hypervisor underneath Mac OS and try and be a little sneaky about it. So that, that was kind of the project goal. 
unfortunately, I just haven't had time to, to keep on working on it, but it might be interesting for present company if you're interested. Uh, definitely keep us posted and Godspeed. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to, you know, drop in updates, even if they're anonymous drive-by on the document for a future meeting, okay. just so they were all on the same page. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can document it. I have a few okay. notes, but. Okay. And are you running any form of Beehive Arm on other hardware? No, not yet. Cool. Because I understand the new Ampere Alta or Ultra systems are very close. And uh, Olivier showed a little demo boot there. And, and he's been working enthusiastically on that. Well, somewhat given into the uh, temptation of playing with the Oracle uh, three uh, cloud arm VMs. So, I mean, basically, I was just using Mac OS as my test pilot. Ideally, what I'd like to do is get an ARM client and get FreeBSD installed on that, and then um, go from the hypervisor from there, and then segment everything out in jails just like you would normally do on an x86 system. Um, but try and move move it towards ARM because really ARM is kind of the future in terms of hardware. So if we can make cool things with low power hardware, I think it has a, a good chance of catching so, on. Few people have been using the uh, Windows uh, ARM64 dev kit, but one thing to watch out there if you're interested in Beehive is that EL2, I think, is... Uh, so, or is it year zero, the one required for the hypervisor is locked away behind secure boot in the EFI firmware, apparently. Hmm. So you have access to the supervisor mode, but not to the hypervisor mode. Gotcha. Hmm, that's interesting. I'll have to work around that. And there's a question uh, from Mohammed of, is this using HyperKit? It sounds like, yes, on HyperKit, but I believe XHive has been replaced by several alternatives. QEMU based, et cetera. Yeah, what well, maybe you guys know, I, I don't know if anyone's tried running QEMU FreeBSD under Mac OS. Um, is there any caveats uh, or things? Uh, Entrenig is using that exclusively. QEMU. It runs very quickly and it has hardware acceleration. So that is a thing. Uh, you can use QEMU on Mac OS uh, 13, but the downside is that you have to be a bit careful about how you configure it. Otherwise, at some point, if you have too many timer interrupts per second, macOS will switch into a poly mode and will burn all of the at least efficiency CPU cores or depending on your CPU schedule, even the performance cores by polling your uh, vCPU thread. Interesting. So you okay. may have to reduce the tick rate to 250 or something from a thousand. <laughs> because otherwise on multi CPU guests, it sometimes happens that they just they produce so many interrupts that Mac OS just says, okay, I give up. I will just uh, let the hypervisor thread always run. Cool. And okay. Yeah. So I seem to remember something about that in the errors. Tick message was default to a thousand, and I was getting some yeah uh, but... garbage. So reduce uh, kern dot hz if you find out that your guest is always spinning uh, with hundred percent CPU per core uh, guest CPU core uh, on uh, the host. Okay. Cool. But yes. um, go ahead. It may oh, be was... fixed in 14, but because there was a, supposedly some kind of slight bug. But at least in 13.1 and dot two it happens. So just to confirm, Apple's hypervisor framework has nesting. Is that accurate? Mm, not directly, I don't think. Okay. So I know that you can, what do they call it? Um, forget what they call their hypervisor. I haven't tried that one yet. Hypervisor.framework, I think. Well, the only one that I've tried was just running QEMU from command line. So I just uh, installed that with, I think it's Brew or whatever Mac uses. Yes, but 
on right, macOS, you front-ends. don't have direct access to the virtualization instructions inside the kernel. Instead, you always have to use their kernel hypervisor side because the hypervisor instructions can have only one basically driver in the kernel and that one is always attached. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Uh, be- and because of that, uh, you can then use any hypervisor on top of that in user space QEMO, VMware, uh, XHive at the same time without them fighting over who gets to use the hardware virtualization. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Keep us posted. That's exciting. Yeah, thanks. Will do. And again, Antonik showed me very quick hardware accelerated builds of FreeBSD under on his little fanless MacBook Air or the light, lightest machine. And I believe there are a number of like graphical front ends available in the App Store, et cetera. So yep. it's, it's an interesting approach. One of the problems I had was that at least for QEMU, I had to build some kind of uh, party tool to get a sane uh, network connection where I could have dynamic bridging and attach to that. Otherwise you're limited to annoying ways to hook into the network. So mm. that, that part with QEMU is still a bit work in progress, it looks like. I think I and that networking are there. work in progress, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Is there a better way to accomplish what I'm doing than using QEMU? No, probably not. Um, unless you want to pay out for the Emria. Uh, I don't know that, no, we'll do a quick look. I recall there being some attractive front ends. Let me see. UTM um, is one of UTM, them. That, uh, exactly. Oh, yeah, UTM, that's the one that... that um... Yeah, I don't think uh, VMware support NAS virtualization, but me running things in Fusion is pretty stable, pretty nice. Okay, cool. And Vincent was very active with that uh, in Seattle. I forget his last name. So yeah, um, but VMware traditionally has nesting across the board, but I didn't ever verify in Fusion. Well, cool. Thanks for that update and do keep us posted as you go. For sure. Um, Michael C., it sounds like you have a demo up your sleeve. Right. That's a... Uh, how do I share? Hold on a second. I'm trying to figure out how to and share. And while this. he finds the green share yeah. button, uh, any other questions, ideas, concerns? Oh, entire screen, I see. Yeah, uh-huh. so either do a, a terminal window and zoom way in, or your screen, or whatever works. But that's a bit. Can you see one screen, exactly one, well, one windows, but two? Two windows. Two yes. windows. Yes, yes, sir. So and you are making them bigger, mercifully. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hold on a second. Let me make it smaller now. Uh, so basically, it's a, my uh, containerization uh, solution of FreeBSD. It has been working for a while. Uh, I announced it on uh, Asia BSD call. The source is still not available in the public because I'm still fixing some, like, uh, stabilizing the image format, all that. Uh, one key feature is that this thing actually uh, can talk to uh, OCI repository, for example, Docker. And then right now I pre-downloaded, well, that this one is I, the one I imported and this one is the one I downloaded from Docker for the demo. And as you can see, this is the R3 repository. And basically we can just push to R3 or the AWS equivalent so you can kind of distribute your FreeBSD containers or basically everything there. Um, a quick demo will be try to run, actually, you know what? Let's try to pull a Linux gel because they usually are pretty small. So uh, by default right now, I configure my system to pull directly from Docker Hub if like a specific name so it's not found. So when you can see here is, ooh, wow, it's really becoming pretty ugly. Yeah, it's really ugly right now, but it's like uh, downloading the layers uh, directly from Docker and then it's gonna stage them. Uh, 
it takes a while to uh, extract the layers and then we are done. And then if we look at the images, we see this is imported directly from Docker. And if we run it, uh, actually I also manage network. So we say How does network it list. Hmm? Uh, materialize the overlays? Uh... Uh, it just materializes it. Uh, basically it does, it just materializes them, extract them to the single set of data set. I have a custom, um, I think I'm in the source tree right now. I have my custom source that um, basically go through the reading the tar headers and the tar blocks. It's written in Rust, by the way. And basically when it encounters like an OCI whiteout files, it would just remove the file from the uh, data set and move on. And if it's like um, encounter a whiteout files and we erase the entire directory, you just do it, but in the data set. So, and because it's like doing it by stream, so you're actually going through the uh, archive, I mean, sorry, the layers in one, uh, one iteration. So you kind of like reading in stream and extracting in the same time. And the extraction is forward to the downstream BSD tar process to do the actual uh, extracting. Uh, right now, it also manage the networks. For example, I have a network called default. And that's the uh, CIDL, and then the last issued IP address is this one. So, uh, which one did I pull? I forgot. Uh, sorry. Maria. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Ten seven. So if I run it uh, and attach a network to it, and by the way, also do VNet um, default, and then I want to run Maria B ten dot seven. I can just run it. And then, okay, uh, on Linux side, you say I need the environment variable so I can add it here. That's the MariaDB password, just call it password. So as you can see, this uh, Linux container we just download from the nice World Wide Web just working. And like the Docker, this thing is only running, it's not the actual process. This is actually a TTY, so we can detach it anytime. And uh, we can, oops, we can attach it back uh, anytime as well. So we are we're How back did to- How you implement uh, the detaching and attaching? Is it a daemon uh, accessing a PTY? Yeah, the daemon is accessing it. Or? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just over you. The funny thing is that it actually allows uh, multiple, yeah, this is kind of fun. I'm not sure if uh, Linux, uh, if Docker does that as, this as well, but you can actually have multiple clients attached to it. I in, implement it. like a data structure, uh, buffer the data from a sender out and all that. So it can pipe to multiple clients. So um, it can be quite useful. It, uh, handle things like control C? It just works. Like for example, if I control C right now, we actually send to the daemon, but you're not actually seeing that because um, by default, when this MariaDB's implementation is that it just ignores control Z. So okay. that, that's how, and you know, what happens it's your with, FreeBSD one. Yeah. What happens if a connected client uh, ju just uh, is um, put to sleep into background and doesn't process the output until the socket buffer fills up or the pipe bar? Buffer or whatever is used. Can you deadlock uh, the uh, container? Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I haven't encountered that yet because by Just default- say uh, I connect uh, two times, one is in the way, I control Z it. No, it does not deadlock then because the data structure only keep track, each client only remember is like uh, is offset. So when the daemon keep pulling data, as well, that's actually a fair, thing that's pulling it, which is the log files. So you see all the log files here, I'm not cleaning them. Oh, but the idea okay. is that there's always a log files that's pulling the data and then filling the buffer. So you keep a complete and record? Sort of, but no, uh, in memory only keep up to one meg. So if you have a client say over SSH is like um, the connection job or just store whatever, like at most you can only read the past uh, history of one meg but you can always find the entire law from the law files, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, awesome, of course, you can also also you can also just don't attach a TTY to it, right? Do so, you, um, so if I then, have a very noisy process which just keeps on writing tens of megabytes a second to this, will it yes, then you have an issue. File and system. You would have that issue going because around, it's, turning into a sparse file after the fact to erase old data. Uh, no, it doesn't. By default, it just do what you expect it to do, which is write all the data. And to me, that is like a responsibility of the operator. Say, this is the file. I need to set a limit, things but like that. It's not can really... Can you rotate the file? Uh, it's not implemented right now, but <laughs> it's, it's before beta. So it's kind of okay. okay. And, Sorry for punching um, holes into your design. <laughs> Yeah, but if I want to like uh, destroy it right now, obviously I can and EQ the thing. The implementation actually um, keep track of undo stack. So every effect happen in the container get add to this undo stack. And when we uh, destroy the thing, it just rewind the undo stack and then do the uh, inverse action. So it, gar it kind of guarantees design. the system. Yeah, it, it kind of guarantees the system always restore to the point when you started. Um, and that, oh, I can't even spell the name, the two. Uh, and also, yeah, so you can pull image from Docker Hub, you can push. Um, maybe we should try a push as well, but it, it can take a while. Uh, but you know what, we have all Does the time. handle um, mm -hmm. volumes, so uh, persistent data? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, volume is, is basically trivial in this design because essentially what you're doing is just adding undo that undo adding a month to the undo that to say hey mount this thing and then when it this get destroyed it just you know amounts it. So uh, yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. really just standard dash v stuff. Uh, port forwarding is a, its own command called LDL. The only reason why it's not in the run command as well is because I'm too lazy to implement that at this moment. Oh. I just you know, as long as everything works, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine. A what few happens, interesting. Mm -hmm. What happens if the long running supervisor process is p kill dash nine uh, and just the uh, undo stack is lost and I try to restart? Do you believe? I have uh, the undo stack is implement uh, serialized have serialization implemented. Uh, if you if you run out of the file it. system. I can, but I didn't do it right now, but I have already planned it out and have that in mind. So if you read um, Rust, like everything here, this is my custom macro to implement that. Everything here is actually uh, implementing the serialize and deserialize uh, trade, mm -hmm. if, as you can see here. So this thing automatically has the ability to write to file system if you need to undo. Interesting. Because you can so always you serialize. Basically out the, the undo stack as an intent lock of what should be there. And then if as long as the uh, undo operations can detect if their job is already done, you would yeah, it's not really in the unit. Time, which yeah. must not get corrupted, but it, you should be able to survive a random kill nine. Right. So, but the, the unit is in a, is in container, which is in in a jail, per jail mm -hmm. instead of per process, uh, for very good reason. But that's a bit too complex to talk about right now. Uh, but the idea is that because it's implemented serialized and deserialized trade, is totally fine. It's you basically get the uh, method to serialize this situation uh, to JSON for free. Mm -hmm. But that's a uh, low hanging fruit, and that's why I'm temporarily not working on it. Uh, but you know, I have that idea. Uh, that's why it has the serialized and deserialized trait implemented. But the idea is that if you want to restore a system, you can. And I think this is very important. Um, uh, yeah. One thing interesting is that it handles automatically that FS rule sets creation. So the, the configuration file is a little bit, by a little bit, I mean very different from the OCI one. Oops. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it's, it's nothing like the OCI one, but it, it's similar in some ways. And uh, out of it somewhere, there's a thing called the FFS uh, rule sets, right? 
So the idea is the container, the image, which I consider is an untrust resources, can have can request like certain device node to show up in the jail. And what happened is that the daemon keep track of uh, DevFS rules as creation. So for example, if the DevFS rule says, um, if the DevFS says like uh, app path, like say dtrace, whatever, ideally this will go through the preprocessor on the daemon side to read the rule set to say, uh, if the administrator allowed this jail to run, and if it's allowed, then this DevFS rule set will get uh, merged with the system one, which by default also expo expose the DTrace helper node uh, and basically create a unique DevFS ID for it. For it. And if uh, on the host, it see another container with the same rules attempt to be created, it can just reuse the same DevFS rule set number. And to answer the question in the chat, this is not uh, implementation of uh, LXC, this thing is uh, written entirely from scratch in Rust, um, kind of fun. Uh, we also do things like adding things to uh, PF anchor and adding the redirection rules to PF as well. Um, so I try to like, you know, get the things that um, uh, FreeBSD spe uh, specific bits in this uh, configuration files because uh, DevFS, I think, is like a really uh, FreeBSD-specific problem. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can also push to, um, OK, uh, credential. Yeah, anyway. Um, so that's also push command. Uh, in this uh, system, I configure my R3 repo uh, to test things. So uh, it's. I just copy this so I can push it to dot r three cl stable container registry. Now, from my experience, um, the FreeBSD image is pretty big because I'm not using uh, Michael D's script yet. Uh, maybe that can really improve the um, the size of the image. So. Uh, for the purpose of doing the demo here, I'm going to push a Linux one instead, and then I'll push a FreeBSD one and hope it can finish uh, quick enough. Uh, .io, and then I'll just call it, I don't know, uh, gel test, MariaDB 10.7. Oh, actually, you know what? I, I just said I'm not going to push a FreeBSD one yet. I'm going to push the Linux one first. Uh, so I'm going to push my local container called MariaDB, that's better, right? Okay, I'm going to push it. And then I'm going to upload it layer by layer. Uh, as you can see, because the Linux container is pretty lean, so it's pushing pretty quick. We kind of just, we export it, but now export in the, uh, oh, it's done. So if we refresh here. So now you see we have a new repository right here. And if we push a free BSD one, uh, which is pretty big. Uh, uh, sorry, CR.io, and that just for FBSD and then just called test. You also just push it. I actually add a commit here that um, that is how you create a new image from the old image. I should demo that instead of just jump right into this. I've totally forgot about that. But the idea is that you can change something in the jail uh, after you attach to it. And then you can issue the commit command, say xc commit, and then the name of the container and the new uh, image name, and it, it just create a new one. And then now you can also push that to uh, any OCI compatible registry. And I can also just pull things from this registry and then use them directly. So basically uh, it's the entire modern container workflow uh, in this kit. And during the implementation, obviously that's like a couple of things I have to handle for example, VNAN and all that. So whatever thing I encountered, uh, I basically do a review. And then if it's something I think everyone can use, if the thing is in jail, I mean, it's in the base, then uh, I just create a uh, fabricated review and try to get it merged to base. Uh, so that's like current, currently the workflow and all that.
So um, yeah, as I said, it's going to take a while to upload the FreeBSD image. It also handles, oh yeah, it's done right now. So if we go back, we load it, and then we can also see the FreeBSD images right here, and we can technically just pull it and use it. Uh, but of course, this image is already here in my local system. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually going to do anything by pulling it. Uh, technically, I should e uh, implement the command to destroy uh, the images, but it's also a low hanging fruit, so I'm not actually doing that yet as well. So there's no destroy command currently. And it totally suffer from like the second system syndromes. Like I probably we, we implemented like two or three times and rip out the ACL uh, modules right now. Uh, but in theory, because everything is actually going through a Linux, yeah, Unix socket, so uh, it would allow uh, unprivileged users to use uh, containers on FreeBSD. In fact, it will allow um, it will allow like the uh, daemon to implement ACL, which is the part I rip out to say if match the user ID is this user, and then try to do this thing with the uh, container, then you can like allow them to do it or de deny them to do it. And basically that's it. It's basically, um, some people will say it's kind of like Docker on FreeBSD. Uh, it mm -hmm. absolutely works. Uh, you just need to fix some minor details and I'm just showing and sharing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Some squares. So well, the reason, <laughs> yeah. There's the a question. The, it's a question why not use RunJ or ContainerD? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, we can totally use RunJ or ContainerD. Uh, it's more in, uh, integrated with the entire OCI uh, platform. Uh, but personally, oh, you should uh, look up my uh, HBSD uh, uh, keynote. Uh, so the idea is that uh, there's something lacking about. Um, the OCI standard because it's really Linux uh, specific. Um, one thing I think like in a normal container workflow you always encounter is that you don't actually know which environment variables you have to provide. So in the previous example, when I run the MariaDB, right, I just forget about the root password, but it still staged my container and then it still run the entry point. And then it tells me, if it's nice enough, it would tell you you're missing something. If it's not nice, it would just crash. And then you have to go to GitHub or whatever, look up the actual documentation to see what's going on. Uh, in this one, it's a little bit different. Uh, as you can see, it's not compatible with the OCI one because the environment variables it required, oh, which is nothing right now, is an object instead of like a, a, an array. And in this object, the actual um, model is something like, uh, where is it? Yeah. Right, can I find it? Can I? Uh, okay, it's in mod. It's, it's right here. So there's always a description and always a required uh, Boolean. So the idea is that the runtime can check for missing variables and missing condition ahead of it actually staged the container. So early checking is possible. And to make it even better, uh, it can tell you why is, why is it not working. For example, uh, in the previous example, uh, the container runtime will tell you, oh, you are missing a variable called MariaDB with password and this is the password of the MariaDB, right? So in this way, we kind of implement, we kind of have some FreeBSD favor or FreeBSD value in these tools because we shouldn't just copy like what Linux does because we have our advantage and it's our it's it's good that we use our advantage. Uh, for example, we have syscontrol D that tells you exactly. Uh, what the syscall show is for, and I, it's, it's going to be really nice and going to streamline with the FreeBSD experience if we bring it to the container side as well. That means if it's missing a variable, it should tell you why is it, uh, why is it missing. And if 
it does a certain port direction, it should self-document and tell you why it exposed a certain port. There's also an additional um, benefit to do it this way, which is say, if you're trying to build something like TrueNAS or whatever, you have an appliance, if you're a plugin system that use container, now you can embed the schema to different variables. So you can even render a UI to say, fill in this variable and that variable and then run your plugin, right? That is a lot better than say, just run this plugin and log into this plugin and change your configura configuration file somewhere there. So for me, the documentation part, right? And then the integration with the system part is really the value of FreeBSD. And I think like if we're going to make a container system, we would do it that way. And also uh, run, I mean, container D is really big. I mean, the entire container ecosystem is really big. And there are things it's designed in such that to overcome some limitation on Linux. Uh, and that's also some part that, you know, it's not really considered uh, things we have on FreeBSD, for example, like the DevFS related things. We can't, we can't really do anything about it. Um, and how we deal with like the system five, uh, the uh, IPC related stuff, right? So uh, for that reason, I'm implementing something from scratch because now we can have something that fit more to the need uh, of FreeBSD community and also like more reflect our values and without need to dealing with thousands and thousands of lines of container D go code, which is really tedious to patch. Pretty cool, man. Really, no, really. Yeah. I like. Uh, but I also noticed that you follow at least as much as possible the commands that more or less looks like Docker. Yeah, uh, I, I try to do it that way because, like, this is again a FreeBSD thing, right? The, mm -hmm. We don't ditch if config because we want something new, right? Mm -hmm. But the same thing applies is that we don't. For me, I don't adapt the runj or container thing. It's not because mm -hmm. the not invented here problem. It's because the things I want mm -hmm. uh, to accomplish with a container mm -hmm. system, which is that it should self-document -doc itself. And mm -hmm. when it runs, it should be able to pre-check without consuming any system resources, right? I don't have, I, I shouldn't need to stage entire jail, entire file system namespace. And then mm -hmm. you, you come back and telling me it does not work, especially mm -hmm. sometimes um, with, with Docker it's even worse, right? Because A, you have log files, and B, mm -hmm. you might have automatically restart. And by the way, because your entry point is part of your process, if you run it in detached mode, you're never going to see the error message. And you, mm -hmm. if you have restart enabled, it's just going to fail again and again, right? So having the, <laughs> um, so having the um, pre-start check, like just check everything ahead of time, is mm -hmm. really going to overcome that issue. Because now if you see an error, you see that immediately even if you're running in detached mode, right? So those are the things I want to overcome. And that's why I, you know, I'm not implementing full OCI um, implementation, but that's some really nice thing we learned from Docker. And for people who use the things, right? They don't have to totally relearn a new thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is something important. And it's not, it's not about this free BSD or Linux. It's about mm -hmm. like what actually makes sense technically. Yeah. Um, right. For the same reason, I think, you know, FreeBSD has container scenes forever, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it's not populated is the reason why Docker is so populated is that there's a distribution layer towards it, right? People, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really um, common system means, but you mm -hmm. can only manage certain machine. And sometimes people want to use the system you already created, but there's no good way to distribute it. And I think the OCI come in and really feed you know, fill the gap between the, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of distribution layer. So, mm -hmm. and OCI is actually pretty inclusive in terms of opening system, right? It's mm -hmm. getting better and better, but the original design has some flaw that keeps um, it away from doing something that's really rigorous, right? So for example, if I want to show you the Maria's uh, DB stuff, uh, Maria DB, mm -hmm. 10.7, uh, you will see this is the original OCI config file. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you put environment variables like this, mm -hmm. 
there's no way for you to actually add annotation or like if a environment variable is required, anything like that. Mm -hmm. To to a specification. Have a level unless, of nesting for that. Yeah, because you you can't ask it, right? And then it you know it's really nice, but just and thank God they experimented it, so we know what to add, mm -hmm. and you know so we can improve upon of that, right? It's it's about um, innovation. It's not about just following things. Yeah. Um, and also you can see there's multiple entry points and exact commands mm -hmm. in my config as well because that's also I think it's an idea. You know, the idea of what a container is, is different. Uh, that's why I talk in the EuroBSD com. Mm -hmm. So for Linux, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, you, you try to solve a dependency problem, right? And then later you realize you need security. Mm -hmm. And that's why the model is that, okay, I have one process and just running there. I assume there's a main process and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, but I see it differently. I see that when you run a container, it is quite literally a, you know, it's almost like um, it's its own ecosystem a little bit. So let's say if I run a database in a container, mm -hmm. right, the command I want to run to attach to that database is obviously somehow bind to that container. So I should be able to define some action in the container config to say a backup command that do a certain things, right, in, in the container level. Because you're shipping your software solution as one whole unit, so, including utilities, and that's the way supposed to do it. So that's why, um, you know, the OCI config is is try to um, show you what to do with one process, and then try to mm -hmm. have like a config that show you what to do with the whole system. Uh, oh, actually, there's something really cool but I cannot show you in this system because so this is uh, a basically API endpoint descriptions. Uh, no, this uh, this descriptor is the OCI image span. No, uh, the different kinds of commands you wanted to have, basically a backup endpoint, a login endpoint. Yeah, stuff like that, right? Because, you know... A setup endpoint yeah. for the initial configuration or something. Yeah. Actually, this so, sounds a bit like... Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. yeah, but on this system, unfortunately, because... Um, this development is pretty old. Uh, I think it's like 20 version behind of the uh, master branch. Uh, so I, I have some issue loading with Dtrace on this machine, but one thing really cool- You because installed kernel and the... running kernel are probably out of sync. Do you yeah. still have the old kernel modules in the- oh, It doesn't matter. I, I can show you something as well. Yeah. Because so that's that actually, the, yeah, that's actually a dwatch command that just launched dwatch. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then with the container, uh, this is another reason why I think it really represents like, you know, what FreeBSD user expect for like a FreeBSD container ecosystem is that if I have a container anyway, I should be able to detrace it, right? And uh, on, on, on Linux, it's really hard because yes, you assume there's one process in your container, that's, but that's usually not the case. Like what if your process fault and set, you know? Uh, you can have it help, but... Um, on FreeBSD, we can because GL is a uh, its own entity in the kernel, so we can just run dtrace against the entire um, mm -hmm. uh, entire GL, and that's why there's also dtrace command here. So if mm -hmm. you want to trace a command, you can just do it, basically. But um, basically, this is the demo I want to show. I know it's kind of a little bit different from mm -hmm. Bastel and Port and all that, uh, but this is more like, you know. Docker ish uh, workflow, you know, uh, instead of like you have something that to manage uh, the jails you created. This is kind of trying to treat the containers you get from internet or from Docker registry as an untrust entity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and do something about it. Yeah, so oh, ACL is actually mm -hmm. a big part this, despite I rip it off uh, mm -hmm. temporarily. Yeah, for the for the command line compatibility or like a drop in is the same approach like Podman is actually did so they did the same trick re-implemented mm -hmm. the whole thing still for Linux first but basically they say at least I didn't really try it myself that there's like a drop in replacement for Docker because uh, if you just uh, instead of Docker you said Podman and the same the rest of the command is exactly the same that's what made mm -hmm. it also a bit easier to transit that's a good idea for the entry points. It's really cool 
it sounds a bit like uh, at least part of what Firecracker does, because mm -hmm. uh, Firecracker, besides the, the the virtualization part, they also have like um, a similar idea. Like they have, you have standard entry points using which you can monitor or trace what is happening in the virtual machine mm -hmm. or control it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and the next actually question that I want, or the last question, sorry. When are you going? Is that open source yet? It is going to be open source. Uh, cool. Okay. I'm I'm fixing something up. For example, right now pulling image is not going to check for duplication yet. It's just gonna pull and then say, "Holy shit, I cannot do it." Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, a bunch of things that I can see is really low hanging fruit. I'm not implementing yet because I'm basically mm -hmm. solo working on it. Uh, but I think the point when I put it on GitHub will be when I'm able to really finalize the image format, because um, mm -hmm. if you look at it right now, it's quite different from the OCI config, but I think there's a, quite a bit of the things that can move, uh, they can copy here as well, such that we have something more similar to the OCI config. So uh, if we need to merge it eventually, maybe we can, um, but who knows? Uh, okay. So yeah, but you know, at the point that I can, um, I think it's more stable for because I don't want to ruin someone else's system uh, in terms of that um, they run it and then they pull it again. Now the image they import previously does not work anymore. Uh, that's what mm -hmm. I try to prevent. And that's why it's not public yet. A part of it is like horrible commit message. My commit message is like AAA, DBB, CCC and things like okay. that, that I'm not proud of. I'm going to get rid of them. Um, yeah, but well, basically, well, you can put it yeah. on on GitHub and at least put a disc big disclaimer as usually people do that it's not for production use at all. Yeah, but at least give yeah. a chance to uh, at least I am interested because we were actually you touched on a many points that we discussed in this call before, mm -hmm. and it seemed that you got into like uh, let's call it the Unix way of containers and implemented in the right direction at least instead of going and re-implementing things that were initially done for linux to to make it run on on, on lazy or eventually i hope that we can make this also work for uh illumus zones yeah i think it should be pretty trivial because you probably just like you know move some attributes around mm -hmm. uh, i i'm not familiar with zone but i think like some probably have similar stuff uh, mm -hmm. you should pretty because underlay is still using ZFS. Uh, to be mm -hmm. honest, the best way to implement is use overlay FS still because uh, that that's some fragmentation problem you you have to deal with with ZFS mm -hmm. because I'm staging the entire thing as one data set in mm -hmm. in instead of like creating a snapshot of every incremental uh, mm -hmm. layer uh, because that's better uh, to look at <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the things like that really uh so overlay fs something equivalent would be really welcome i'm planning to support that mm -hmm. um yeah but i think it's, it should be pretty trivial to port to uh say illumos how we so yeah and as a plus actually mm -hmm. as a plus actually yeah yeah you can see the data set the final stage one just right here basically so you are snapshotting, or you're not? Uh, when you run it, it will create a snapshot. It will create a clone, and then uh, enter this XC run uh, data set. Okay, but you're not snapshotting each layer from the OCI. No, no, no. I'm not snapshotting okay. uh, each layer because that's technically I can do that. Uh, that's probably a good way to say like recover <laughs> like a previous version somewhere and then do the thing. But I do have a custom set of S attribute I set that annotate like all the past layer that's encapsulated there. Oh, one thing is funny. Um, one thing is uh, about OCI planning to deal with is that when you download it, you actually download a compressed layer. So you don't know the diff ID yet until you extract them. Uh, that's supposed to be like a, a requirement to say the order of the archive need to match the order of diff ID you have in the configuration, uh, but this this thing actually go through the extraction, uh, check something, the uh, doing the hash of the outer layer that means the archive layer, and doing the uh, SHA of the uh, unarchived 
version of the tar in the same time. So everything actually uh, just read the stream in one go, uh, one iteration, uh, which is which makes it pretty efficient. Cool. As a plus, I checked actually from our last call if you, rem I think the last one, yes, that the mm -hmm. uh, AWS uh, Elastic Container Service Agent is actually open source. Mm -hmm. Oh, with cool. That, yeah, with that, it would be really nice to try if we, of course, it's not going to run out of the box. We need to change something there. If mm -hmm. we have, let's say, um, a FreeBSD EC2 image, ready mm -hmm. for ECS that is equipped with the agent uh, rewritten to integrate with XC. Oh, cool. Uh, can you send uh, send me a link? Uh, uh, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Yes. Well, it's not going to, again, it's not like it will, uh, we need, you need to re-implement some parts and they set it explicitly if uh, they only support the version that they run it, but it, they don't say that it, that it will not run. So basically we will be running it on our own in that sense. I see. Uh, oh, by the way, don't worry about the password. I will change it later. I will regenerate <laughs> a new one later. But here's the debug message you can all see. Oh, uh, one other thing is that right now my policy, if I cannot find all the original uh, archive data, uh, like right here, I would just do a FATA. So I would just like do the entire set of SDF as like a single fat layer and then upload. Uh, that's probably a better way to deal with it. But uh, yeah, this is why overlay FS is still important because it guarantees you can still, you still have those layers and you can still upload the same thing. Uh, but if you if I remove everything here from the cache, then the next time I upload, it's going to be uploading a, a single fat layer instead of like, multiple individual layers there. So that's a one limitation uh, I have right now, yeah. Yep, so I think that kind of concluded the demo, unless I forgot something. That's awesome, keep it coming. And I see you are using do as, is that finally caching credentials on FreeBSD? Because there was a point it wasn't, and it was a bit frustrating. Uh, I'm not sure, I just use, uh, without password because I'm Got lazy it. on this machine. Okay, uh, fine. Yeah. Cool. Um, Anthony has a question. Uh, mm -hmm. What, and maybe it's a broader question, what jail monitoring and logging solutions are there? I think you have to use the, uh, the K mod that's on GitHub that basically, um, you know, read from the uh, sequence uh, packet. And then, so you know that's, something going on uh, with the jail, like, you know, uh, a jail start or jail die or something like that. But I I think you can use OpenBSM as well, maybe. I don't know. But uh, so far, I don't think there's like some really, really good uh, jail locking facility. Does someone have a, is that the same like DevFS or DevD, uh, pop, pop, component mentioned earlier, or is that a different one? Yeah, yeah. Came out? Okay. Uh, basically the same thing. Oh. So BSM as in Sun's tool? Uh, Open BSM, I think is uh, trust the BS, is from trust yeah. the BSD. Got it. Yeah, I think it's, it's, made, it's probably sponsored by Apple or something, which is really weird. So here's a link to that in the doc. Okay, cool. And how recently was that touch? 2009, 2007, okay. Uh, GitHub, cool. Well, that is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And well, the, yeah, here's I mean, the, the Docker is a proper a part of it is about ecosystem, right? I, I kind of think sure. if I can show people, oh, you can just run a normal Docker container, then, then probably more people is uh, more likely to use it. <laughs> so I, I trust that's heavily using the Linux compatibility layer? Uh, the Docker container part, yes. Okay. Uh, but the goal is always, and the design is always for FreeBSD, uh, the native path. So the idea is that integrate the strength of FreeBSD, uh, even the undo stack, the undo stack is actually not one-to-one -one tied into each jail, which sounds really weird, but that's the for the potential when I do an NFS jail, 
So two hosts might host might have the undo stack, but about the same container, such that when you release the jail, um, you basically ask both systems to do the undo stack, such that the set the new uh, I mean the the root uh, the jails without system can get released properly on the remote system that's not actually running the jail as well. So that's like some like weird design decisions in there, like to handle these kind of things. Cool. Any last questions or thoughts? I certainly hope you have bandwidth to work on that. Anything else? We covered a lot of good ground today. And a small programming note, there will not be a Beehive developers call tomorrow. That will be scaled back perhaps for a OpenZFS or Dtrace informal discussion periodically. Mm -hmm. well, great work, Michael. And Jamie, congrats on those commits. And thanks for looking at uh, Michael's other work. Do reach out to each other individually as needed if you have questions. Yeah, thank you guys so much like for all the questions and feedbacks. Hey, of course. That's 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 why we're here. And there's one more point there. Yeah. Well, if you stay around in your BSD call, uh, the coming the coming one, you also see the exact same thing. So well, there's motivation to get that uh, published. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, let's call it at 23 after. I'll be around just a moment, but I've also got quite a few things to attend to. And uh, I suppose I will see some of you at EuroBSDCon. My talk was accepted. Sounds like yours was too. Mm -hmm. And Ooh. yeah, sounds like Mohammed, you can make it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I don't, uh, I'm not experienced enough yet to have enough content for a call, but a uh, talk, sorry, but I will be there at least to, for the conference. Yeah. Now, this raises the question, should there ever be a Euro Beehive Con, Jail Con or something? But that's only been a thing in mostly Tokyo plus Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Cool. Uh, okay. Regarding your managing the host from the um, jail uh, question. Mm -hmm. So Michael asked... Oh. Uh, reached out to me and asked her about race the uh, management jail could uh, manage its host. Yes, which by is kind a, of a, a the, privileged uh, serial line or so. Yeah, but uh, the NMDM driver can do yep. this, but only one session at a time. Okay. So you could use CU to connect to the NMDM device and have a, a GetTTY running on the host. And then you would have to unhide the other end of the uh, virtual null modem. Mm -hmm. But uh, more elegant solutions would be to use Unix domain sockets. And for example, have uh, inetd from the host drop a socket into uh, the jail file system. And then you could use SSH to with a proxy command to connect to the Unix socket and use SSH over a Unix socket to the um, an, uh, SSH server spawned on demand. This gets you a proper TTY and supports arbitrary numbers of sessions. Cool. Uh, and I found the time to try it out and it works. Oh, do you have that syntax documented? Uh, well, um, there wasn't much to document. <laughs> oh, fair enough, fair enough. Is it in the uh, chat you dumped me? So the syntax is this. Uh, and uh, I suspect some might want to run, but uh, this partly plays off of Jan's comments last round that it looks like you could perform uh, perhaps VM and jail configuration via binaries over an MDM as if you're using it like a serial device in the good old days. So um, you ahead. drop this line or something similar to it uh, into your um, INAD uh, configuration and start INAD and okay. or you spawn an INAD per management jail if you have multiple. Um, this uh, sets the owner and group and 
permissions on the device. Uh, on the sorry, on the socket. Mm -hmm. Um, you tell it that it's a stream socket and to just spawn an SSHD in a D mode. Cool. Okay. And because nobody uses SSH porn, hopefully, so SSH protocol version one anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to generate a per start up um Diffie Hellman key pair and so on. So startup time shouldn't be a problem anymore. Uh, just make sure you don't lack any uh, host keys and so on. Um, in SSH um, um, connection variable, so once you're logged in, you see the socket path and the other one is just unknown, the client address. So it can cause a problem with client certificates if the client principal is limited to some source addresses or something, or the even if it'll if it expects the host uh, to provide a certificate for an IP address. I don't know if you can put in a socket path as a <laughs> into an SSH certificate, but that's a corner case. Okay. I, I just encountered because I'm using my own SSH CA. Yeah. Uh, and other than that, it just worked as expected with uh, public key cryptography. So cool. And can you describe for the group what you mentioned about uh, an MDM serial so, uh, interfaces with configuration information? Okay. The uh, the question I was thinking I in my mind was how do you get the initial configuration into a jail? So that you can make use of something like a FreeBSD release uh, image and don't have to put your Ansible pull or something in there to provision it. And the simplest tool I know of, which is uh, capable of doing everything you need to, uh, is the config init script from um, Colin Percival's EC2 scripts. So what it does uh, in it, or is it in it config? Uh, let's check. Uh, yeah. It's config in it. And it simply uh, reads its input file as, um, and looks at the first two, three bytes if it's either a, uh, the complete content of a file, something to append to a file, a command care, to Michael. execute, or um, a tarball. Otherwise, is it if it's a tarball, it unpacks the tarball into a temporary directory and recurses it to the directory and just in lexical order goes over all files. Again, so you could, the nice thing about this is that it nests, so you can have some tarball for one part and another one and you tar them together and you get a new tarball and it works. And the question is, how do you get this into a beehive or into a, a, or jail uh, environment? And one way to do it would be over a serial connection or in beehive's case, a vid.io console device. In a jail, um, there are lots of ways to get it in, but um, for big files in a the beehive in context, you could even use a read-only uh, file containing the uh, a GPT partition table around a tarball without a file system. This has, if it's just US tar, it has the added advantage that even GNU tar and similar implementations can make use of it. And it's just a raw file in the host context. So it's doesn't have to be a Z wall or some other kind of special storage. And it's just a read only device. So it would be a good way, I think, to get something like this into the FreeBSD base basically, and have it turn on automatically depending on if it's jailed or running under a hypervisor if the first boot file exists. So that you have a blessed way to uh, insert uh, first time configuration into uh, FreeBSD user land. Does that make sense to anyone or did I lose you? I can't find my original docs to it, but that was indeed quite exciting. I think you gave me a quick demo, but yeah. that's uh, quite promising. 
and I love the simplicity of it. It's like some early, you know, some routers that you simply drop maybe the firmware in over serial and just nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, for a serial or se port like device, whether uh, a virtual null modem cable or um, an additional serial port for a Beehive VM, um, you could have something running via GetTTY to basically read the config in its stream from the virtual console. Mm -hmm. And of course, another one logging, right? Hmm? Another TTY logging. Sure, you, you basically want, in that case, system. you would want it to have three uh, console ports. Oh, it's one for the logging, one for the interactive login, and one for provisioning. Any questions for Jan regarding that? It's a conversation I'm sure we'll keep going over the next coming weeks and months. Okay, I am updating the the wrap up to 33 after, and uh, I think a bunch of us have to run. Thank you so, so much. Talk to you perhaps in a week. Okay, see you then. Super. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jan, Anthony, Mohammed. Thanks. Hey, Michael, can you yes. add me to the other two meetings too, please? Yes, I can. I'm especially right now, I've been working on um, trying to figure out. Um, BPF tools on Linux and how mm -hmm. that translates to um, to BSD. So definitely want to get in on the D-Trace call. Indeed. So do you have the books, plural, from Brendan Gregg on the topics? I do. I have Great. all three of them. Ah, uh, if you are able to give the group a quick compare and contrast and state, this actually came up in a recent call. I think if you even search the doc for, the doc for BPF, you may see... Uh, hey everyone, wh wh where are they at? <laughs> so, well, I know Brendan Gleg's um, port to BCC tools is going to become the de facto norm on GNU Linux. Right. And I, I've been working with it, just creating uh, monitoring scripts and such. But what I wanted to do was figure out how to do all of that and put BPF tools in a jail and hypervisor scenario mm -hmm. so that I could um, merge all of the logs for everything and get better observ observability. Because one of the things that I like to do is watch the kernel process, monitor the logs, and then convert that to a JSON and ship it out to a database. Nice. So because you get all that extra visibility, you can throw it all in a database where you can work on it later. I yeah. was just trying to find that same functionality between scraping jails and what's going on in a jail versus in a beehive. And, you know, I, ideally I'd like to find one way to do accomplish all three. So you have logging on the system, logging on the, on the VM and logging in the jail all in one tool. Make it so this is the way. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. It's a okay. pretty, well, pretty big ask, but we'll I see. will call the official meeting and stop the recording. Just one sec. So thank you everyone.